Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Michelle Conley. She's an activist who lives in Prince George, B.C., the traditional territory of the Claytley Tene Nation. She has spent much of her life exploring, experiencing natural forests, has an educational background in forest ecology, although she is not a researcher and does not do science for a living. Michelle is part of Conservation North. So first, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek. So um, can you talk a little bit about Conservation North and talk especially about the uh, forests of the interior British Columbia? Yeah, so when when you think of old growth forests in BC, your mind probably goes to the coastal rainforests. BC has some, had some really high profile struggles for protection of old forests in the Great Bear Rainforest and Clackwatt Sound in the 90s and the 2000s, for example. But we haven't quite had the same level of public attention on old growth forests in the BC interior, which is where we're based. So our our community group is based in Prince George, which is in the central interior of BC. So if you look at a map, we're right in the middle. And our home base is in the traditional territory of the Clayton Tene Nation, who have been here for 10,000 years at least. Um, so. The reason we uh, are focused on this area is that we are hundreds of kilometers from the Pacific Ocean, and yet we have two different rainforest types just in our backyard. And it's really the only place in the world where you have temperate rainforests so far from the ocean. So our, our rainforests are um, colder and snowier than on the coast. They get a lot of rain and snow because of how air masses move from the west, from the Pacific Ocean towards the Rocky Mountains to the east of us. Um, this is called orographic precipitation. So we call them rainforests, but a lot of the precipitation, about 40 percent, falls as snow. So you could call them snow forests. So we get long, snowy winters and cool, wet summers. And what is well just out of curiosity like how much snow do you get and then and then second what does this mean how do what's the difference between a rainforest in this case and a drier forest of the of inland bc yeah so um we have two types of rainforest here um the the inland rainforest and the boreal rainforest. And they get um, sometimes several meters of snow in, in the winter. And they're dominated by forests that get really old. So in other parts of BC, um, you have forests that have short fire return intervals. So um, fires are a normal, larger fires even are a normal and natural part of the way those forests develop. But in our local rainforests here, that's not the case. So the inland rainforest stretches south into northern Idaho. Um, I'm most familiar with the northern part of it, which is the wettest part. Um, the area we're in is sometimes called the Upper Fraser. Uh, it's the headwaters of the Fraser River. And the inland rainforest follows the Rocky Mountain Trench um, south into the northern uh, U.S. there. Um, the tree species that characterize the inland rainforest are western red cedar and western hemlock, but there are also other species there as well. Um, the rainforest is really rich in species of lichens and plants. It's very lush. Um, you were asking about snow. So deep winter snow really plays an important role here because it prevents frost from penetrating into the ground and protects plants and soil life from extreme winter cold. And um, in the spring, the melt from that winter snowpack recharges the groundwater and it sustains springs and seepage areas that support really old, like ancient cedar stands. Um, and then the other rainforest, uh, which we call the boreal rainforest, stretches north from the inland rainforest up into the Peace River watershed. Um, 
the landscape of the boreal rainforest is rolling mountains. When you walk into a stand, you see dark, tall trees, mostly spruce and sabal pine fir. You get prickled by Devil's Club. Um, there's lots of thimbleberry. You might come across grizzly bear, moose, wolf, um, fisher, martin, flying squirrels, pine siskins, great grails, woodpeckers, just to name a few things. Um, there's also bull trout in the rivers of this area. Um, and the, one of the amazing things is that both rainforests have all the pre-contact large-bodied animals still, like grizzly bear, wolverine, cougar, wolves. So, um, so yeah, to get back to your question, because of the topography and climate, this area is not like some of the drier forest types in BC that burn regularly. But that's not to say that there are no natural disturbances at all. We do have those, and they're a really important uh, part of these forests. So we have defoliating insects, so insects that um, feed themselves by chewing the needles and leaves off of trees. We have bark beetles. We've got root and stem decay fungi. Um, sometimes windstorms blow over large old trees, or you get a lightning strike that kills a tree and then doesn't spread very far. Um, and in these, you know, rainforests, new trees establish themselves in openings or gaps created by the death of those trees. So um, those natural disturbances create um, heterogeneity that wildlife need. Um, <coughs> so if you were if you were a northern goshawk flying over one of these rainforests and looked below you, about about 80 percent of these landscapes at any given time would be old, so several hundred years old. And in the in the inland rainforest, some of the forests are over a thousand years old. Um, the the really long fire return intervals mean that you get a lot of accumulation of um, living tree tissues, fallen trees, um, soils. So these ecosystems are really good at storing and sequestering carbon, for example, um, and they release carbon when they're logged, of course, which is why the logging industry is one of the biggest emitters in BC, and I can talk about that a bit later. Um, we also have some really iconic species. So deep snow mountain caribou are endemic to BC, and they rely on these rainforests. They depend on old growth for foraging and for avoiding predators. They eat hair lichens in the forest canopy by walking on top of the winter snowpack. And of course, those lichens take centuries to establish and grow to volumes that are capable of, of feeding them during the harsh winters. Um, and then there's a really amazing lichen diversity in these forests. So some of the species have really fun common names like cryptic paw, smoker's lung, crumpled tar paper. And the lichen diversity is, is one of the reasons that this place is gaining some attention. Um, old growth conditions are where moose yard up during deep snow. So they stop moving, they hunker down under the big trees and they conserve energy by not mo moving. Um, a lot of medium sized carnivores like lynx and fisher need old growth for denning and raising their young. We know that bears use the roots of big old growth trees to excavate places to hibernate. And I've even seen a photo of uh, a black bear hibernating up inside the broken top of her, an ancient cottonwood tree. So up to, like 50 feet up in the air. Um, and I think um, just personally that one of the most amazing things about our local rainforests is that they're really quiet. Um, I think if there's a sound I associate with them, it's the sound of moving water or the trickle of, of melting water. Um. So a couple more questions, and then let's go on to the timber industry up there. Um, and the couple questions are are not quite so serious. One of them is, well, they both have to do with the trip I took in 1989 up to the Northwest Territories, where one thing I found incredibly beautiful was that there was a single road that was crossing. The wasn't the road wasn't beautiful. That was crossing hundreds of miles of unbroken forest, and I kept thinking. 
this is what the whole continent was like that was unbroken forest. But because it was so far north, the old trees were actually pretty small. And, and are you, but you're still in a region where the trees can get, it's warm enough that they can get pretty large. I guess there's three questions. Another one is a species you didn't mention. I lived in North Idaho for a few years and a, a species I learned to know there, I think I get the name is, is larch that is an evergreen. I mean, it's a conifer, but it, it loses its needles. Mm-hmm. And, and do you have those? And then the third question, just the other memory I have of this trip in 1989 is, is mosquitoes the size of small airplanes? Um, <laughs> and since this is a rainforest, do you have, do you have, I, this is the only place I've ever been. I was at a, I was at a camp, like a, a provincial camp, and, um, the guy who ran it walked around in a beekeeping uniform to, <laughs> for mosquitoes. And it is, was it a, was it a bad day or is this life in that area? Um, okay, so uh, I can talk about those three things. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the um, the, the wizened trees that are old but small. So um, it's it's really important to distinguish between low productivity old growth and productive old growth BC. Uh, sorry, productive old growth forests in BC um, because. There has been really misleading information about how much old growth forest is left because um, the provincial government and industry groups together those uh, those kind of small old growth trees and the productive old growth that the companies want. So, like you said, uh, you you pass through an area that had some um, kind of shorter, skinny trees. So, if you you know you've been in bogs or high up in the mountains, and that those trees get really old. Um, but they grow, they, they grow in nutrient poor habitats. So they're really important to protect, of course, because they're uh, natural forests. But, um, but the, you know, the, the reason that type of forest still exists, old growth, is because it hasn't been desirable to industry. So the most threatened, uh, old growth in BC is productive old growth. And so when we talk about, um, old growth, like we really are, uh, emphasize, like we really put the emphasis on productive old growth because that's where, um, the biggest and easiest to access trees were, and they tend to be in lower elevation areas, flat areas along the main rivers. Um, and they were naturally rare to begin with here, and now they're extremely rare because of 100 years of logging. So, so yeah, that gets at your question about, you know, the wizened old growth trees um, and then the productive old growth. That is, that is really um, what we have to protect now. And, of course, like you and me know, um, industrial society – goes after all elements of nature eventually, um, if given the chance. So we have to protect it all. But right now, the, our focus needs to be on the, the high productivity ones. Um, and then you asked about larch. Um, I don't think we actually have larch naturally up where we are. I have never seen um, larch trees. I know that um, larch is probably part of the mix of the, like you said, it's part of the mix of the forests further south, but I haven't seen it up here. Um, and then about the mosquitoes, um, yeah, like if you go out in uh, like May, June, July out in the rainforest, it's totally death by mosquito. So um, some people can handle it. I I douse myself in, uh, you know, uh, bug repellent. And um, the worst is trying to go to the bathroom, of course, when mosquitoes are everywhere. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, we do get pretty serious mosquito issues here. So one one last thing about that, since since you brought up the bathroom thing, <laughs> um, I was car camping that trip and sleeping. I mean, there's no way I'm going to camp out when there's mosquitoes, I and mean, you can hear them doing. I mean, forming squadrons. Anyway, so I'm I'm sleeping in the back of the car, and I can literally hear them tapping on the window, and. Um, and then I had to get up and pee in the middle of the night. And in the time it took me to unzip, pee, and then rezip, I got nailed like a half dozen times just in that little spot. I I like to keep yogurt containers in the tent with me. That's my little secret so that I don't have to go outside with a lid. Um. So, but having said that, um, so who who eats the mosquitoes? Who is that a bounty for? Oh, um. I, a good question. So I'm no wildlife biologist, but I can imagine there are a lot of birds, like the insectivorous birds that uh, really consume those bugs. That must oh. be a real smorgasbord for them. Fish, fish. Oh, eat the of larva. course, 
fish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the larvae. Yeah, for sure. And do you eat? Do not do you eat? Do you have bats up there? Yes. Uh, so, yes, um, we do have bats. Yeah, the northern myotis bat is a uh, is a red listed bat up here, but we have all sorts of bats. Yeah, I I love watching them at night. And um, how about dragonflies? Do you have dragonflies? Definitely, dragonflies, damselflies. Yeah, so uh, those are all the predators for the mosquitoes. So, yeah. Okay, so let's move from a a a let's move from one sort of bloodsucker to another. Um, <laughs> from mosquitoes to timber industry, mm-hmm. from a natural to unnatural one. So talk about the timber industry and what's happening there. Okay, so um, as you know, the the biggest threats to our last productive interior Olga forests are industrial logging and the roads that go along with it. So there is really no, you know, the, 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 there's no historical precedent for what's happening to our old growth forests now with the rate and scale of industrial logging. Um, as I mentioned before, most of these landscapes are supposed to be old, but that's not the case anymore. And we are part of what we're doing is trying to increase the public understanding in the interior of how bad the situation is. Um, we've been using visual aids like photos and video and increasingly maps to show how much primary forest is now gone forever. So some some background um, and a little bit of history. So logging really started in our area in the 19 teens with sawmills that popped up in the communities along the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. I learned that apparently mills built in the 1940s and 50s only lasted a few decades before all the accessible wood was exhausted. There were around 800 mills in mills in the area, sawmills that is, in the area in the 19, in the mid 50s. And then, of course, in the 60s, the pulping industry established itself, and along with that came the practice of clear cutting. And of course, all of this is supported by an extensive network of roads. So. Um, as I mentioned, this all went after the valley bottoms. Uh, many of our valley bottoms have been logged and converted into farmland. Um, and so licensees are now setting their sights on the last few unlogged valleys in the central interior here. So um, our, our system was created by a colonial government. Uh, there was something called the Royal Commission on Forest Resources in 1945 and 1956. Um, Royal commissions are, are a form of kind of official inquiry into matters of public concern. I don't think they call them that anymore. But they, basically, they promised a perpetual yield of wood and sustained economic prosperity for community stability and steady employment and paychecks. And, um, you know, something called an annual allowable cut approved by someone called a chief forester. So an annual allowable cut is the volume that someone's allowed to cut in a five-year period. So um, I have, you know, a list of all the things that are working in tandem to uh, to create the situation which we're in today, which is one of degraded, uh, roaded, fragmented forests. Um, so, um, and it, it's not in any kind of order, really. Um, I have six things to talk about here. So modern forest management in B.C., like, I guess, from what I understand, it's the same uh, where you are in the U.S. It's founded on an ideology that views forests as a commodity to be exploited. And so old growth forests have been viewed as being in the way of more productive younger forests uh, that can provide a predictable flow of wood and revenue. So we've treated old growth forests, A, like a harvestable crop and B, like something that needs to be replaced. In the United States, they sometimes call them uh, decadent or overmature. Yeah, we use the same terms here, or they were in use, and actually some people still use those terms. And that language, I, I am not a violent person, but that language just makes me shake with rage. Yep. Yeah, that's um, some of the – I mean, I've heard even people with, uh, you know, under the age of 40 use those terms, which is really weird. Um. Yeah. So. Um, oh, also, I just want to say one thing, which is, I don't know about the forest up there. I'm guessing it's the same. But the whole notion of younger forests being quote more productive is nonsense anyway, because it ends up that old forests. I know in the states. Again, I don't know about that far north, but I'm guessing it's the same. That old trees and old forests as a collective actually sequester more carbon, which means that they're putting more carbon into wood, which means they're actually putting on more volume. Um, 
by tree and by forest per year than younger forests. It's just you see them when they're young, but they're so skinny that you know it, it looks like a big deal when a when a tree that's one inch around grows ten feet, as opposed to when a tree that's 150 feet tall grows an inch and also expands by a quarter inch. Yeah. Um, so it's it's all crap anyway. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the pernicious myths that I wanted to talk about a little bit later. Just, um, you know, as you said, there's been, you know, an explosion of research about how, um, you know, older, bigger trees are, are better for storing and sequestering carbon. And of course you lose all that carbon when you log an old growth forest and the more carbon it has in it, the more is belched out when you cut it. So, um, yeah, there are some really disingenuous um, arguments for logging and the idea of, you know, thrifty plantations um, being uh, what we want instead of old growth. And, and those, those same ideas are really uh, are, are insidious ones that um, are, are restated by, you know, municipal governments here, sometimes provincial government people like it's really it's scary. So, so I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were talking about the six items on your list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there's also been uh, an uncritical acceptance and use of technology. So um, recent technology means that forestry companies now are more efficient than ever at converting forests into profit without the need for jobs or people. So, um, you know, I was looking at the, the Professional Foresters magazine a couple years ago, and there was this image of this scary looking machine on a really steep slope. So now we have technologies to allow industrial forestry in places that were really challenging or expensive to access previously. And of course, it only takes around two people in a machine to push down hundreds of hectares of forest in a few weeks. Um, and just as a side note, I think that the companies operating on, um, you know, indigenous lands and public lands have been aware of the decline in our forests for a long time. They have really sophisticated ways of collecting data like LIDAR and drones. And um, um, so this is all, in my opinion, really planned. And, and they have they definitely have an awareness of it because of their uh, use and access to technology. Um, so one big one, a really important element in the decline of primary forests here in BC is corporate control over public lands through something called the tenure system. So, so tenure means the conditions under which the land is held or occupied. Um, even though 94% of land in BC is, is quote public land, um, private interests control most of the harvestable landscape. So the control of forests was essentially gifted to timber companies by the province. Um, in, in BC, the majority of public forest land has, has been leased to private timber corporations on long-term uh, replaceable or renewable contracts that are replaced at their discretion. So uh, the replaceability thing is written into the Forest Act. Um, there are provisions for the government to cancel a tenure for failure to meet the obligations, but it's been seven decades that we've had the tenure system in BC, and my understanding is that no major tenure has ever been canceled for mismanagement in that 70 years. So um, this system has enabled certain types of tenure holders to successfully challenge government reductions to annual allowable cuts or government policies to conserve forests for the for the public interest. Um, so under current legislation in BC, you cannot protect any land that, quote, unduly reduces the supply of timber for logging. And so that means that you can't protect wildlife habitat, fish habitat, water, soils or anything if it means not logging an area. Um, Conservation or, you know, connecting conservations, you're not allowed, conservation areas, you're not allowed to have an impact on the timber supply. So, so you're supposed to limit any conservation to areas that haven't, that can't be logged anyways, basically. So you're, you're allowed to, you have to limit the conservation to those um, unproductive areas. 
Um, a community group in the, the southern interior part of BC recently tried to stop logging in their watershed because their drinking water was getting contaminated. And they discovered that under current legislation, industrial logging is actually allowed to ruin your water as long as that water can be treated and made drinkable. So again, nothing can unduly reduce the, you know, access to, uh, timber. Um, timber tenure holders, so forest companies that have licenses are compensated for lost timber cutting rights when lands are taken out of their operating area. Um, this happened in the creation of an indigenous co-managed protected area on the coast quite a few years ago. The Forest Act says that licensees must be compensated, quote, in an amount of equal value to what is removed. Um, more recently, uh, a small protected area was designated. It's an indigenous co-managed protected area, and it was sized so as not to trigger compensation, which probably would have been prohibitively expensive. So they made it, um, they, you know, the people planning the protected area had to make it under the size that would have triggered the compensation in order that it can happen. So um, the process, just some background, this is maybe a little bit arcane, but um, under current legislation, timber companies can create and submit, sorry, the, the process they have to go through is that they create and submit a really perfunctory, vague plan, which has no specific spatial or temporal detail, like maps or timetables. It doesn't have those things. Um, and they're also really difficult for a regular person to understand. Um, and then the district manager is obligated to authorize um, or approve the road and cunning permits under this vague plan, which is called an FSP or a forest stewardship plan. So the ministry must issue a cutting permit when a company submits it. It's a literal rubber stamp. The ministry does not have the right to not issue a cutting permit if a company submits it, if you'll believe that in BC. Um, one of your previous guests ta has talked about the idea of permits and the fact that they're called permits for a reason. And this is an example of that. Um, it's also really hard to, uh, for the public to get site plans for cutting, cutting blocks, um, at, well, you, you can ask for those plans, but at that point, the government's already approved those blocks. So, and they don't have to have any detail with respect to location. You just get an approximate location. Um, you don't have any say in where or whether or how it will happen. Um, you, you actually need to physically be there to see the plans as well. So if someone from, say, Vancouver wanted to know about imminent logging plans, in the, the, in the caribou habitat and the heart ranges, they would have to fly all the way up here, which is an, an hour flight. And then they'd have to rent a car to go north of town uh, to the Canfor office in McKenzie. Um, and then you'd get a printed map. So, um, so in, in the rules say that you need to go to the place of business nearest to the area under the site plan in order to actually see it. Um, if a member of the public makes a complaint uh, about, uh, you know, cutting and the licensee doesn't resolve the matter. There is no authority for the district managers to actually do anything about that. Um, and then under this, under this category, uh, there's this thing called stumpage, which is the rent paid by tenure holders to the government, um, and this fee is not determined by the market. The, the tenure holders essentially decide what that is. So they decide how much they pay for public timber. So we're not even capturing the full value of what's logged. Um, if you compare the stumpage for the same species and grade or quality of tree with stumpage in the U.S., the U.S. prices are often two times or more what's paid here. So, you know, the U.S. is correct that we subsidize timber companies um, w with low stumpage for one. Um, and of course, companies now are pushing for a reduction in stumpage in order for them to remain competitive. But that's a different topic. Um, so essentially, public forests, our public forests are a, a private timber supply um, 
uh, and then and then the other thing is that the province doesn't monitor the amount of old <coughs> forest on the landscape here in the Prince George timber supply area um, that is left to a group of licensees that operate here. The the province just doesn't have the the staff to actually measure and look at how much old growth is still on the landscape. So it's like a fox guarding the hen house type of situation. Um, and I'll stop. I've got a couple more things to talk about under that category, but um, maybe you want to say something or ask questions. Um, no, keep going. The, the, the only thing I, w- I was going to say was that I thought the United States Forest Service was bad. Um, but, I mean, they have a lot to learn from the way the Canadians do it in terms of of, Setting the uh, bar low. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. They I got. They, they really have to. They really have to drop their game to meet the Canadians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I learned a bit about uh, how how horrific it is in the U.S. Uh, in your book that you wrote about, I guess, fifteen or sixteen years ago now. Um, but yeah, we're definitely uh, as bad or worse in BC here. Um, this is worse. This is mm-hmm. this sounds worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are the champions. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so go ahead. Go ahead with 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 what you're saying. I just this is just this is just appalling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, the last two things I want to talk about with regards to, uh, or oh, sorry, there are three. Okay, so um, in the past um, 15 years, so private control of public forests has really been strengthened with uh, something called the Forest and Range Practices Act. So that's legislation that places timber ahead of all forest val- other forest values. Um, so it's a results-based legal regime. And it's been done in combination with something called professional reliance, which places, you know, most nearly absolute decision-making control in the hands of forest professionals and consultants that are employed by timber companies. So having said that, I, you know, it's, um, you, it is important to involve qualified professionals in day-to-day management, but not in the place of, um, you know, legally enforceable, strong environmental protection. Well, apart from which, let's just let's just be honest. I mean, 99 percent or 95 percent of all foresters, if they were judged by a jury of trees, would be executed immediately. I mean, most <laughs> foresters are. And, and and I'm sorry, what's the what's the line from Upton Sinclair? It's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. And we've all known People who work for for we've known biologists who presumably went into the field because they love animals, who um, work for timber industries, who sign off on whatever crap and say no, this will never harm X species, Y species, Z species, as they're driving those species extinct. I mean, they know what they have to sign in order to keep their jobs. So it's just absurd to have um, industry specialists uh, overseeing industry extraction. Mhm. Yeah, I Yeah, I could I could definitely talk about that a bit more. It's it's difficult because um you know, professionals that are employed by private corporations are are just involved with the worst kind of conflict of interest because if they want to stay in business, their opinions have to be supportive of the private corporations and you know, the probability of future employment or contract renewal depends on them obtaining beneficial outcomes for their employers. And of course, wildlife and fish don't have the same influence on their decision. Um, and, you know, weirdly, even though we're supposed to be relying on professionals um, in BC reports prepared by them on, say, hydrological assessments or terrain stability there's actually no requirement to make those publicly available here. So, so yeah, professional reliance gives, uh, the system gives the upper hand to, to industry and their foresters preparing the plans, um, because they have the data, they've seen the sites in question, they formulate the objectives and, um, and government is so short staffed that it essentially has the effect of basically kind of privatizing, um, public forests. Um, so a journalist from the coast the the other day used the term the forestry industrial complex in a really good article, so I'm going to steal that term. The, the industrial timber lobby in BC has a very powerful grip on the BC government. 
the Council of Forest Industries, or COFI, represents all the forestry corporations in BC. So to name a few that whose names you are familiar with, the Louisiana Pacific, Camphor, Interfor, Weyerhaeuser, Sinclair Group, uh, among a bunch of others. If you just go to their website, you can see all the groups that COFI represents. Um, the forest industry across BC is in a state of crisis at the moment. Um, sawmills and pulp mills are shutting down or cutting production, or they call it curtailments. So in response to that, industry is doubling down on their entitlements, and Kofi uh, is at the forefront of that. Um, the timber lobby complains that large areas in BC have been set aside for conservation, which is a lie. Less than 5% province-wide of what's in protected areas of all kinds is old growth forest, which is what they're interested in. So we have very little protected. Um, they, they blame drops in the wood supply on beetle outbreaks and fires, which are convenient scapegoats that I can talk about a bit later too. Um, and I've heard people with many years working in the forest industry say that timber companies represented by Kofi have, have orchestrated this decline through you know, overcutting, mechanization, raw log exports. Um, and we know, in the, uh, yeah. In, in the 80s in the United States, um, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there was all this, there were these big timber wars in the, in the, in the western, northwestern United States. And one of the things that just made me very angry was that um, journalists, mainstream journalists would always, they would call it jobs versus owls. But they would almost never mention the fact that through the 80s, the cut went up and the number of employees went down because of raw log exports and automation. They never mentioned that. So it actually was not jobs versus owls at all. It was raw log exports and um, automation versus jobs. Totally. Yeah, I've heard old timers here tell me about how many people used to work in the mills here. And I've also heard people my own age have those experiences um, that have ha experienced those changes themselves. So, um, so yeah, apparently since 1960, there's been a 700 percent reduction in person years of labor per unit wood harvested um, in B.C. Um, and then another fact that I read recently in a in a, um, a master's thesis is that between 1980 and 2010, Canfor which is uh, a, a local company here, tripled in size in BC while reducing its employment by half. So um, on that note, um, Kofi has a really rich top policy ask from the BC government right now. They have rep a report on their website um, and their top policy ask is to secure what they call, and I'm putting this in quotes, a working forest. So they want to designate an area for harvesting and lock down the industrial timber land base across BC's last public forests. And they also want to implement a no net loss policy to provide certainty for the long term. Um, and then creepily, they want to expand the use of LIDAR, which stands for light detecting and ranging technology. And they want to expand the use of artificial intelligence and drone technology to complete an updated enhanced standing timber inventory. So of course they want to rely on, on, you know, technology to do the work of, of humans. Um, and some other things they're asking for, uh, is, a maximum of two years following wildfires to harvest timber, um, which is one thing that's uh, that um, is really bad because um, you know when you log after a natural disturbance, you're uh, you're doing a lot of harm. Um, well, also forests need dead trees that that can't be set often enough that that. Um, forests, dead trees actually provide more habitat than live trees in many cases for, um, everybody from beetles to birds to, 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 to bears who might, who might sleep in a, in a cavity in a dead tree. It's, it's, 
everybody needs dead trees. Forests desperately need dead trees. And it makes me so angry to, um, to hear the timber industry talk about dead trees going to waste in the forest. Yeah, I've, I've heard, um, wildlife biologists say that, you know, some people will argue that the value of a tree starts when it dies to wildlife. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound really tinfoil hatty here, but I know that people in the timber industry are really rubbing their hands as, you know, as, as information about how the climate change is going to change, um, our landscapes here because <clears throat> I, I, I sort of feel like they, they stand to benefit from, um, the, the really, the reactive, um, things that might happen, um, in response to fires and beetle outbreaks and other impacts of, of climate change. But of course, like you mentioned, um, fires and beetles are a normal part of our landscapes here. But yeah, it's, it's something I can definitely talk more about, you know, like just, uh. That's not too well hattie at all. That's, uh-huh. that's just how capitalism and in fact, garden scale abusers, that's how they work is, they turn anything, any disaster to their advantage. Yeah, you're right. It's, I guess it's disaster capital. Is that what disaster capitalism means? Um, sure. Okay. Um, and, and also just to let you know where we're at, we have about eight or nine minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah, I, I'll finish this thought. So one of the other things they want is a, a biomass tax credit, uh, uh, to, to be able to produce more pellets. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, that's all I'll say about that. And then lastly, I want to talk about regulatory capture. So wait, I want to say one, one thing, two, two things about those. One is I would not actually have a problem with, and you said something about no net loss. If it was like no net loss of caribou and no net loss of lichen and no net loss of, of old growth forest. And if it was, and same here, I would not have a problem, even though I hate these corporations, I wouldn't have no problem giving them a biomass credit if what that meant was not, if biomass did not mean cutting down the trees and pelleting them and burning them, but instead biomass meant we will give you money for the biomass that's on your land. So if there's more biomass at the end of the year, we'll actually give you more money, mm-hmm. which is actually, if you're going to have a quote stewardship program, that's how it should be run. Mm-hmm. But of course, that's that that simply took those words and turned them to entirely different meanings. Yeah, they like to do that. Um, yeah. So in while Kofi has been complaining about how we have too much protection here, how fires and beetles have ruined the wood supply and how stumpage is too high, they're actually investing south of the border. So. Since 2011, Canfor has acquired 12 timber product manufacturing facilities in the southern U.S. Um, so they have a total of about 17 down there. Um, Where they are deforesting four times faster than the Amazon, by the way. It's, and it's really scary. exporting all of that wood to, to Europe, and it's called carbon neutral. It's horrible. Yeah, I, I have read about that and heard about it from people embroiled in that, in that, um, horrifying activity down there. Um, and you know, like we just don't have the inherent productivity here to grow trees like they do in the southern U.S. So the soils and climate are way more productive in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi and Arkansas where, and the Carolinas where they have their operations now. Um, and they can grow what they call fiber in those places. So they're not, I'm sure you've picked this up too. They, the for, these companies refer to forests as fiber, um, not as forests anymore. They're not like living ecosystems. They're like metamucil or something. Um, so yeah, we've had uh, voracious industrial logging driven by machines. And uh, now we have a timber supply shortage and they're moving away. Um, and unless we stop this, they, they will log the last of our productive old growth and then they'll be out of here. Um, uh, and of course the, the, the government is supporting it. So, so senior government people are really sympathetic to industrial forestry here. They're really committed to a system that's clearly failing. So they provided, uh, public money to warehouser recently to fertilize their tree farm recently. Um, they committed $24 million to market BC wood products. So this is a subsidy to, to private corporations who are destroying our forests. 
And part of that is $1 million to promote the use of wood pellets to produce energy, which, like you said, um, is more greenhouse gas intense than burning coal. So, so that pellets are really a looming threat here in B, here in BC. And I recently learned that there are local tenures here for companies, uh, for, for uh, a pellet company. So they're actually logging. We were told by the province that they would not be logging. They would only be using quote wood waste to, to put, um, to put into these pellet plants, but, but that's not true. They actually have their own tenures to actually turn forests into, into fuel. Um, Sorry, how much time do we have left, Eric? Um, we have about four or five minutes. Oh, my goodness. That's okay. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this conversation. I'm sad that it's almost over. Um, me yeah, too. What would you What would you like me to talk about now? I would, like, I, I would like for you to talk about why you're telling us this and what you want people inside and outside of BC to do. Okay, so... Um, our last, our, our, our productive old growth forests in the interior here are special and they are in deep trouble. The, the province, right, the BC government uh, recently completed this public engagement. So thousands of people across BC submitted feedback to them on how they feel about old growth forest. And it'd be a really good time if people emailed the Minister of Forests here, Doug Donaldson, and the Premier, John Horgan to tell them that you care about BC's interior old growth. That's a really key thing to mention. Um, they like to really ignore people in the interior uh, and the forests of the interior in terms of how ecologically valuable they are because um, I think they kind of rely on the lack of public profile of our, of our local rainforest here. Um, and we need to be a really firm that there, there's, there's no room for, for re more logging of our primary forests here. We need an immediate uh, halt to logging of our last primary forests. Um, we did a, a mapping exercise recently to see how bad it was. So we just used the freely available government data to map the cut blocks um, over time. So we wanted to basically map the what's still left as, as primary forests, not just old growth. And there's very little of everything. Uh, it's very fragmented. And basically the only places that are left here in the interior are the places that are too expensive or inconvenient to access. So we need to protect those areas um, immediately. And the more public pressure, uh, the more embarrassment, um, the more we can make those in power uncomfortable, uh, the more likely we are to be successful. Um, and if people in BC are listening, um, we need to apply uh, pressure. And um, we need to be ready to take other action if those options aren't adequate to protect our last forests. So that would be a great place to end, but we're not going to end there. Um, can you talk a little bit about Conservation North and both about what it is, how it formed, and for people who say live in Alabama or South Carolina, um, what they can do not to help you, but to start something local that does what you do? Yeah, so uh, we are uh, an eco-centric group. We uh, we believe that primary forests ought to be protected uh, for their own sake. We le believe in protecting nature. We're a group of people that came together because we all love nature and wild places. Um, we, we know that wildlife are experiencing unprecedented declines here, and the main driver of that is habitat loss and degradation. So we're trying to stop that loss in our backyard, and we really feel like it's important for local groups to, to do that. So we're all volunteers. We all have um, day jobs or are full-time parents. Um, I, I have a day job, so this, we, we, have to, we have to do this work in our spare time. Um, any, any money we get comes from donations and, uh, we've been able to accomplish a lot just from getting public donations here. Uh, so any of the mapping exercises, gas so that we can go out and, you know, uh, do dro drone filming of la the last intact forest and of the logging. Um, all of, most of our group, uh, you know, ha ha has, ha has an emotional connection to our local landscapes. We've spent time in them and we we know these areas and um, we think that's really central to people having a credible um, you know position on protecting these places is spending time in them um, it's important to make connections to the local indigenous people too um, we 
Um, yeah, so we're all really passionate about protecting our local ecosystems. And, you know, I, I've only seen pictures of, of what the natural ecosystems in that part of the U.S., you know, like Alabama looks like. But, um, you know, the, the impression I've got is some of those last places are probably really magical. And um, all the natural ecosystems we have remaining in, in North America now are really precious. And um, once they're gone, they're gone. Um, you know, one of the, the horrible myths that's been perpetuated about old growth is that it's replaceable. And that's one thing that we've, we've tried really hard to, uh, to combat is this myth that it's a renewable resource. Um, intact ecosystems are not a renewable resource. There's no mitigating damage to them. There's no, uh, um, there's, there's no no net loss really of ecosystems because once they're gone, they're gone. You know, Richard Manning made that point to me in 1989. I, I sort of said, gosh, it'd be great to set aside some land that would have been cut over, and then in 500 years, it's an old-growth forest. And he said, Derek, in 500 years, you have not even gone one time through the carbon cycle because the tree has to grow. It falls over, and then it can take hundreds of years to decay. So you're still only partway through one carbon cycle in 500 years. If you're going to actually, quote, replace old growth forest, it will take a couple, 3,000 years for it to even go a time through the carbon cycle. Yeah, and one of the, um, you know, evil things that's being promoted now in BC is is logging old growth as a carbon management solution or as a climate solution, um, promoting the use of wood. and. In actual fact, um, like there's there's been an explosion of research saying no, the best way to deal with climate change is to protect intact ecosystems, to protect intact forests. Um, it's the you know, only way, really. Yeah, and you know, upwards of half the carbon stored in old growth is lost when you log it. It stores and sequesters carbon. Um, it's all held in the living in the bodies of the trees, living and dead, and in the soils. And um, it takes it takes a decade to recoup. You know, it takes decades to it's the time factor that's the matter. You know, it's it's all about rates. Right. But when presuming it, it grows back, which is not a given. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, uh, and in any know, case, that that doesn't do anything for the habitat. That's right. It's not like if you wipe it out, the 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 the, the, speed, the wildlife is going to be there waiting in the wings for 200 years for it to come back. Um, you know, old growth forests create their own microclimates that feed back in a positive way to create the conditions for the young trees to grow up in. So um, once you turn an old forest into a plantation, there is no way to bring that back. So uh, one last thing, does does, um, does Conservation North have a website or any way people can, can look at your work or get in touch with you? Yes, uh, our website is just conservationnorth.org. And our email is info at conservationnorth.org. So everything they need to know is on our website. They can just Google Conservation North. Um, and I, I love hearing from people from other places. So all your listeners are welcome to contact us and contact uh, me directly to find out how they can um, help um, or, or, you know, get any tips about how they if they want to form their own local groups, although I'm sure a lot of your listeners already know that. But, um, yeah. So we're really out of time, but, but is there any one last, tell, tell us one last beautiful thing about the old growth forests there. Like what's your favorite thing you haven't got to say? Your favorite creature, your favorite sound, you've already said sounds. Your favorite creature, your favorite lichen, your favorite whatever. Um, well, one really special experience I had was a few years ago I was, um, walking through, um, in an area called the Goat River and, um, it was an opening created by uh, a defoliating insect, so there were a lot of downed, big downed trees. And about 20, 25 meters away, I see this big furry head pop up, and it was the most beautiful grizzly bear I had ever seen. Um, she was a cinnamon color with kind of blonde tips on the back of her head. And she, she, I think maybe she had been rooting around in, uh, digging for things there, and she looked up at me um, and we stared at each other for a couple of seconds. And then she just looked back down and continued to do what she was doing. And, um, you know, I, I, I left her alone after that. But that was a really special, special experience for me. 
Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you for all of your tremendous work up there. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Michelle Conley. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.